All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for Everyday Sustainability, Building a Foundation for Sustainable Prevention Throughout the SPIF with Erin Ficker. This presentation was prepared for the Great Lakes PTTC under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. The opinions expressed in this webinar are the views of the speakers and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services. The PTTC believes that words matter and uses affirming language in all activities. I wanna share a few housekeeping items with you. If you have technical issues um, throughout the webinar, please individually message me, Rebecca Buller, in the chat section at the bottom of your screen, and we'll, I'll be happy to assist you. If captions or live transcript would be helpful, please use your Zoom toolbar to enable by selecting live captions or live transcript. Questions for the speaker, uh, if you please put those in the Q&A section, also at the bottom of your screen. That way we won't lose them in the chat as things scroll by, so please use that Q&A section. We will be asking for your feedback. We'll launch a poll at the end of the webinar, at, um, and then we'll also invite you to share your pluses and wishes in the chat, or you can send them privately again to me or to Chris. Certificates of attendance will be sent out via email to all who attended this webinar in full, and it can take up to two weeks for that to arrive in your inbox. If you'd like to know more about what we're doing or information on upcoming events, please see our social media pages. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Erin Ficker serves as a prevention manager for the Great Lakes PTTC. For more than 16 years, Erin has worked in substance abuse prevention, supporting communities to use evidence-based strategies and data-driven processes sorry, in substance abuse prevention planning and implementation. She works with community-level prevention practitioners and schools in the development, implementation, evaluation, and sustainability of prevention interventions. And now I'll turn it over to Erin. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you all for, for being here. So I am really excited to, to share with you this webinar today on everyday sustainability and hopefully um, everyone can see my slides here. Um, I um, like I said, I'm really excited to be here and talk about sustainability in a way that we don't always talk about it. And was excited also to see as you guys are coming in the room and in the chat, people from all over the country, Ohio, Oklahoma, Florida, Michigan, I saw Illinois, Woo, I'm in Chicago. So I always love to see my friends from Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Pennsylvania, it's a wide range and we're really happy to have you here today. So our objectives and our, our goals for today are really to, um, to talk about, you know, what, what we mean when we say sustainability, you know, so definitions are important, but really like, what are we talking about? Um, we want to talk about listing the, we have the, these three kind of keys to sustainability that we'll get to that are some pillars of how we think about and accomplish sustainability. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how sustainability then is woven into the SPIF process um, and how it connects to um, the everyday things that we do. So every day we do prevention work and every day we have the opportunity to do tasks that um, build and promote sustainability of our programs. So with that, I think we should just dive right in. So sustainability, it, it's a community, it's defined by any number of people in any number of ways. Um, but this is one definition that we find um, in our work that it's an ongoing, it's the ongoing capacity and resolve. I love the word resolve in this definition to work together to establish, advance and maintain effective strategies that continuously improve health and quality of life for all. I love the, the, the words and you'll see I've bolded them, the ones that really um, speak to us and that is, it's ongoing, 
Um, it's collaborative. Um, and it's about maintaining effective strategies and improving the quality of health. So I love this kind of continuous ongoing definition of sustainability. And it's that's a kind of a big way that we think about it. But if we want to get a little bit more specific and we want to think about sustainability in a way that um, SAMHSA really specifically kind of starts to put a finer point on, capacity, sustainability is the capacity of a community to produce and maintain positive prevention outcomes over time. So in a more simple, more direct definition, we think of community, we think of sustainability as this capacity to focus on our prevention outcomes. Um, and I think it's important to, to recognize that when we talk about sustainability, we should be thinking not just about our programs, not just about our grants and our jobs, but really about those outcomes. If we frame it that way, the rest will come. So we'll talk about that as we move through today. So um, if you want to, as we move along, feel free to drop in the chat um, any, um, any thoughts or comments that you're having as we go. We'll try to keep an eye on those. Um, we'll also save some time at the end for questions. But as you look at these definitions of sustainability, I hope that those kind of ring true with your experience and can uh, help you think about how we frame the work. Um, so one of the things I want to know is kind of where are we starting? And uh, oh, there we go. So I, we're we're trying this, and I lo love this as an approach for us to understand where you're starting from and how well we do in communicating these ideas uh, to you over the course of the next ninety minutes. So we have this little pretest for you, and it's really it's really about me understanding what you're doing and what you know coming in and what you uh, kind of at the end will think again about, about these questions. So just no pressure, the following questions, um, tell us a little bit about um, what you know. So the first question um, in that poll, and you'll have to scroll down to get to um, the three questions we have, um, just which of the following uh, select one uh, are the three keys to sustainability? Uh, and Erin, can I just interrupt yeah. that folks should only complete this if they are going to stay for the entire time so they can complete the post-test. Thank so if you, you so much. If you aren't staring on the whole time, please don't take it. Thank you so much, Chris, for that reminder. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, if you're going to stay on the whole time, we would love for you to to um, take this so then at the end we can find out how, how well I did in communicating these ideas. So the three keys to sustainability, and you have three choices there, um, true or false, it's important to begin sustainability work at the implementation phase. Um, and, uh, and examples, we have three, four options for the examples of everyday sustainability actions. So take a minute, if you wouldn't mind, to, to go over that. Okay, I'm just going to give you a couple more minutes, a couple more seconds, 30 seconds maybe to finish those questions. And again, remember this is, there's no expectations that you would have this knowledge coming in. That's why we're all here. And Chris, if you can just let me know when. We're worried about 74% uh, participated right now. Great. Okay. Well, I think we'll move on then. If uh, you go yeah. ahead, I'll leave it up for a minute or two. And Thank then you. I'll take it down. Perfection. Thank you all. Um, and 74% of you, I, I love that. Thank you. Let's get, let's get higher. Let's everyone decide to stay on this webinar the whole time because it's so fun. Um, okay, so let's move on. And we want to talk about working towards sustainable prevention. And I'm going to use this term sustainable prevention programs, sustainable efforts. We're talking not just about the sustainability of our outcomes moving forward, but just the overall sustainability um, of our work and developing a foundation of sustainable prevention. And as we work towards that, I think it's really important to remember that sustainability um, is, it's a cycle, it is a constant, um, there's a start and finish that bump right up against each other because we really are going to continue that process throughout. Um, there's 
when we start our prevention work at any point where we come into this, we want to start thinking about sustainability. It's never too late and it's never too early. And so that's a lot of what we're going to talk about. And what does it mean to be sustainable and to move through this cycle um, and to continue this work every day? One of the things I think is helpful for me, and I, I hope can be helpful for you as we move into this, is looking at what is it our end goal? What is it that, starting with the end in mind, right? What is it that we are trying to ultimately accomplish? And what we are trying to ultimately accomplish are these, the components that we're gonna sustain. And what we wanna sustain are our strategies that work, our prevention outcomes, and our effective planning processes. If we go into our work thinking our goal is to sustain strategies, meaning that the strategies that are working, we want to be able to keep them moving. And again, I think that's important, that clause, not just our strategies, but our strategies that work. And that's part of making sure that we're effective and we'll get into that as we move forward. We want to make sure we're focused on those outcomes. You saw the definition, the definition ties into outcomes. What is it that our, um, what is it, what, what are we trying to achieve? What progress have we made towards that goal? And um, how can we make sure that we maintain that and keep those outcomes? Uh, and lastly, this, this effective prevention processes. And I, and, you know, this is really getting to the strategic prevention framework, which is one of my favorite things. And you'll hear us kind of get to that in a minute. Hopefully um, those of you uh, on the call are familiar with the strategic prevention framework, but what we want to do is make sure that the processes we are using to implement strategies that work to reach our prevention outcomes, that we protect and maintain and sustain those processes moving forward. It's not something that we always think about, but it's something that's as important as all the rest. So if we start here knowing this is what we want to sustain, our everyday work can be focused on getting here. It's also thinking about the end in mind. Um, oh, thinking about the end in mind, we want to think about what are the ways that we can sustain this work. And one of them is here uh, with resources, right? So one of the ways that we can sustain our work is to increase our resources. So sustaining those three things we just talked about, you can do that one through the, um, the acquisition of new resources. So whether that's money or support, it's, um, it's an essential component. So as we think about that, if you think about going into this work, we think about one of the things we are gonna need is resources. Um, another way that we can think about sustaining our work is through um, adoption, meaning our partners or our schools, our community will adopt what we've done and take and run with it. So if we think about, and this picture always reminds me that in prevention, a lot of our work is to seed good programs, get them off the ground, start them and then let them grow and have the community take them over, and then we can see the next thing. Um, that's what adoption looks like. And it's a lot of work to get to a place where we're gonna have um, the community or partners adopt these programs. I'm gonna talk about the way we do that as we move forward. And lastly, the way, uh, the, the last way that we sustain our, oh, our work is through, sorry, um, is through the implementation of norms and guidelines that we're changing the community norms, the community understanding, and we're also changing the guidelines. So that's a lot of the work that we do through um, policy work and uh, community norms. We want to think about these three things all the time. We want to be thinking about creating sustainable prevention means we're sustaining those three things we talked about earlier, right? Outcomes, processes, and strategies. And these are some of the ways that we can do that. Building um, networks so that the programs can be um, adopted by others, building uh, resources, um, and also making sure that we're developing norms and guidelines that will outlive our work. Um, so I, I want to ask you, um, how, how does this, how do you think about why is this important? And if we think about our everyday work, um, how does this 
how does keeping this end in mind transform how we think about our work every day? And that's kind of a big, big question or big thinking. So feel free to put in the chat what you're thinking about. Why is it important to keep this end in mind? How does this change the way you might think about your work? Um, and feel free to put that in the chat as we move forward. Um, and I don't, I, th I see things moving, but I don't, okay. Uh, permanent lasting change rather than short-term change. Wonderful, yeah, that's a great way to that this helps us refocus. It keeps you focused on sustainability, right? And I think it keeps us focused in a way that's specific to our, our hopes for what sustainability can look like. Um, that's like I'm seeing things move, but they're not. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's not dependent on one person staying. Oh my gosh, Debbie, thank you. Absolutely. We don't want our programs to be dependent on the work of one individual. Um, and it's about, you know, so Bill developing other leaders to do what I do. Absolutely. We are going to really dig into some of these components of quality and consistency, capacity building, uh, partnerships, sharing the load. Oh, I like that. I'm going to take that. Um, tied to outcomes and not programs. Oh my gosh, Emily, thank you. It takes the stress off you if you aren't the only one making the change. That's wonderful. So again, keeping these things in mind, what we're trying to sustain, approaches that we can use to sustain those um, are really going to help you think about how to build those partnerships and really take the load off you as an individual. That's not to say that that's not easy work, but we will get there. Thank you guys for sharing your thoughts. So I wanna talk about um, the keys to sustainability. And the, there are, the keys to sustainability are a concept that are, is, inc is incredibly, uh, old is not a nice word to say, but um, well-established and well-used. Uh, the keys to sustainability were developed a very long time ago, uh, but they really hold and ring true. Um, every day for us. And we want to think about these keys are going to be the foundation upon which we build sustainable prevention and we work towards. And so, so those are, and I'm advancing my slides like a champ. Uh, they are the first organizational capacity. And this is the capacity of an organization to continue to um, deliver strategies that are effective, um, that they have the structures, the administrative support, the staffing, the oversight, all in place to implement sustainable prevention, to implement effective uh, sustainable prevention programs, to work towards outcomes, and to, um, to implement processes and work through processes. Um, so, all that capacity is in place, everything from administrative support all the way through to um, developing those processes. So that's the first is really developing that organizational capacity. The next one is effectiveness. And this one I can't underscore enough and you'll hear me talk about it a lot as we go through. But effectiveness is the idea that um, if we do effective prevention, it is sustainable. And it's sustainable because one, effective prevention is gonna help us change and build norms and guidelines. It is also going to get to outcomes. The more effective we are, the more buy-in we get, the more we can show that prevention works and prevention is important. Um, so effectiveness, while it doesn't always ring about sustainability, it's important and we know that's what we're trying to do is do effective prevention. But it's also one of the things that will ensure that our programs and our outcomes, our work lasts beyond us. And the last is community support. We talk about this throughout the SPIF process. We talk about the importance of um, having, organiza having organizations and individuals and the community as a whole buy into our work and support it. If we don't have um, the support and the of a community, um, the ability to carry that work forward beyond us is just not going to be there. So community support is really, it's making sure that we have the capacity within the community, that we have stakeholders and leaders who support our work. 
Those are the three keys. And we're gonna keep those as mind, in mind as we move forward through this idea of everyday sustainability. I like to think of sustainability every day as, um, the, as milestones. What are the things we are trying to, uh, that, that we'll know along the way um, have set us up? And so when I think about um, the SPIF process or I think about the work that we do, we wanna think about that milestone of saying, if I get here, then I've done the sustainability work and checking in regularly about that, it's gonna be important. So what I wanna do is I wanna move through our work and talk about these milestones and how they connect to those keys. So for example, let's talk a little bit about coalition milestones. We know that a coalition is essential to doing our work and doing our work well. All the things we just saw about, um, about the keys and about um, the approaches to sustaining our work all tie really tightly into having partners and um, having the work shared over uh, multiple folks in, inside the, um, the community. So coalition milestones. So when we think about what is it that we will achieve that will help us get there? One of the milestones you wanna reach is to have essential partners and members recruited. Those folks are on board. That's gonna help in your sustainability efforts. You wanna make sure that your recruitment plan is in place, that you have a way to continually grow and build that coalition. We've talked about this in some of the other webinars that we've done at Great Lakes about coalition be best practices and coalition best practices include governance policies and processes are in place. Having a well-functioning coalition makes that process and that coalition more sustainable. So ensuring that you have those governance policies and processes developed is a milestone you're gonna wanna get to. Sustainability committee is created. So think about a subcommittee or a working group, however, whatever you wanna call it. There is a group of people who are dedicated and focused to talking about sustainability. And lastly is, um, the members capacity building plan. So you wanna make sure that you're building the capacity of your coalition members so that they can be those partners and those champions in the community, which we know are essential to sustainability. Let's think about these milestones then as they relate to the keys. So if we think about this, I am terrible at advancing slides. There we go. So if we think about kind of crosswalking this, what would it look like? Where, you know, so you can write in the chat for me um, where you think essential members recruited. That's that milestone we're reaching. What does that play into for us here? How does that, um, there we go. Um, what is it that we can see here? Where do those go? So if, is that gonna help us build organizational capacity, community support, effectiveness? Um, Dion, absolutely, organizational capacity and community support, that's exactly what we're looking at here. Those are gonna check those boxes for us. Having a recruitment plan, same thing. It's gonna help build that organizational capacity so that we have a plan in place for recruiting that builds that organizational systems. We also know that recruitment plans are gonna build sustainable uh, community support because we're constantly have that in place um, to continue recruitment. Thinking about governance, that's organizational capacity. The organization being our coalition here, but that's best practice. And that's gonna help us get to that organizational capacity level that's sustainable. Sustaining subcommittee is again, that organizational capacity and having a member the capacity plan in place will really help to make sure you're building the support of the community. The more our members know about our work and can speak about it, the more we know they will, um, they'll bring others along with them and that helps to build community support. So why not effectiveness? Great question. When we think about effectiveness, we're really thinking about the effectiveness of our strategies. It could be argued, and I think it's an interesting point that um, this is the effectiveness of our, uh, gets to the effectiveness of our uh, processes that we want to sustain. 
I'm really focused when I think about effectiveness on the effectiveness of our strategies. So you could absolutely make that case. But I think here, I really wanted to focus us on that these are the things that build organizational capacity and community support. You'll also see as we go along that these tables shift and we'll see the check marks moving around. Um, Oh, so interesting. So, so Leah says it's important to stop the subcommittee when it's no longer needed. And I'm going to challenge that and say, I think sustainability should always be considered. So all the time. And I agree, subcommittees should not just operate to operate. They should have a clear charter and a clear reason what they're doing. Um, but sustainability should be considered all the time. And so that committee can be that little voice that reminds people to consider sustainability, even when we're wrapped up in the, the business of, um, of implementing strategies that can be all encompassing. What does it look like? What does this look like in action? And I've already kind of gotten to this and I would love to hear from you guys as well on what does it look like for you to, um, to meet some of these milestones or to work towards sustainability in in your uh, prevention work. So I'll, I'll share an example that um, in a community where they, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they were struggling with building community support. They were struggling with building a coalition that was really active and engaged. And in large part, what they had skipped, the piece that they hadn't gotten to was that milestone of putting a community capacity plan or a capacity building plan in place for their members. The members didn't have the buy-in and understanding, excuse me, about prevention science. And so when things got hard, they didn't have the understanding of kind of the, the processes that it would take to get to. So when when the coalition was really trying to, to follow the strategic prevention framework and really trying to take it slow, build capacity, do a planning, be data-driven, all of the things, the coalition started to lose interest because they just wanted to do. But they hadn't built in space and time to build the capacity of those members, both initially as they formed the coalition, but also as new members came on board, it didn't take long for them to realize that the coalition members were turning over, that the coalition wasn't engaged in the kind of daily work of prevention. And that was really necessary in order to do it well, in order to build capacity and do the planning process well. So ultimately it just, it didn't serve the program. So taking a step back, we, we spent time with them to help them understand how can you bring them up to speed so they'll stay, so that they'll understand the work, and so they'll understand why it's taking so long to get to the place where they can just do. Um, so through those discussions, we really helped them build that plan. They put that plan in place and they really started to see a change. It didn't happen overnight, but it did. they did start to see a change. If you can put that plan in place early in your coalition work, early in your prevention work, you're less likely to have to spend that time rebuilding. So thinking about how that one milestone really helps to create a coalition that that can help you build organizational support, but that can also uh, can build community support, but also build the organization's capacity. So Karen, you're saying we're a small community, um, so capacity is different um, than of larger organizations with more, absolutely. So capacity is gonna look different in different places. I'd say that it's so important that capacity of your coalition members means they understand your work. They understand prevention. They understand prevention science, just a little, right? So they put in a place, so with, with this particular group, they were working on underage drinking and um, youth cannabis use were their priorities. And so when they finally put in place a, an approach, what they did was infused into their coalition meetings um, discussions about resources or about a webinar 
and just brought some resources to the table. And so different levels of um, engagement and size will change what that looks like. But they were able to say, hey, you guys, here's a link to a webinar. If you have time to watch it, watch it. If you um, have time to read this resource, and then they spent time in their coalition meetings having conversations about that. The more the coalition knows about prevention science, prevention approaches, and the importance of the SPIF and those processes, the more likely they are to stay and help you build community support. So absolutely, it's, and it's going to look different for everyone. So any other thoughts about what this looks like for you with all of these kind of going back to those those milestones that what they look like for you? Okay. Well, let's keep going because I want to talk a little bit about we're, and we're going to kind of talk about how this infuses with the SPIF. But I will tell you the best way to sustain your work is to use the strategic prevention framework and to use it with fidelity. If you're not familiar with it, it is a strategic planning model that goes through five steps and has two underlining um, uh, <laughs> essential, I can't think of the right word, but the, the two main uh, underlying components of it are that we focus on cultural comp competence or cultural, cultural humility, um, and that we are thinking about sustainability. And that's what we're doing here today. We're trying to think about how sustainability infuses into assessment, capacity building, planning, implementation, and evaluation. So as we move forward, we're going to talk about milestones in each step of the SPIF and how those relate to building those keys to sustainability. Assessment milestones. So in assessment, that first step where we're going to start the data collection, data review, we're going to identify our problems. This is where um, we think about the milestones that are essential. And those are key partnerships our key partners are engaged. So we're gonna have to have key partners that are essential and related to assessment. Those are data partners. Those are um, folks who help us analyze and assess the data. Um, so we wanna make sure those guys are engaged. Data sharing agreements are formalized. This to me is one of the most important and most often overlooked milestones. Things need to be formalized. Um, and again, in a small community versus a large community, that may look different, but that's gonna make sure that you continue to have that moving forward, that data and that data sharing. You have to make sure that your problems and priorities um, are problems and related behaviors are prioritized. You're gonna do that in the assessment phase. Another milestone is that capacity data has been reviewed. So you're looking at what the capacity looks like and that you are identifying service and capacity gaps in your community. So those are the things you have to accomplish in assessment generally, but also these are the things that when you accomplish them, you're building sustainable prevention. So those are those milestones. And as we look at how those milestones relate to the keys, right? Having community partners engaged is going to get us to that organizational capacity and that community support. Again, we're in those that that area, really process focused here. Data agreements are formalized. Again, I can't underscore enough how important this is. And it's going to ensure that you have community support because you have formalized agreements with partners um, and build the organizational capacity to continue that data collection and data review process um, kind of in the future. Uh, capacity data is reviewed. That's going to get you to some effectiveness, some organizational capacity. If you have any questions about kind of how we or why I um, we put these in these areas, feel free uh, to throw that in the chat. I will say that you know you could probably make a case and already have for why they might fit into other areas. What we're doing here really is to just say why why is this important and and what are the ways that it's helping me build a foundation for sustainable prevention. And then also that the gaps are identified. And this is about effectiveness. We want to make sure that the work we're doing is filling a gap. It won't be effective if we're, we're doing work that doesn't fill that gap or we're doing work that um, that's, that's duplicative, right? That's not going to help us get to outcomes or to be effective. So these are some of those assessment-specific milestones. What does it look like? What are your questions? So as we sit here for a second, what are the questions you have about those milestones? Um, and it's, I can kind of go back and looking at those milestones for assessment. I'll share with you that, and I, I've already kind of given away, <laughs> what does this look like in reality? Is this, this data agreements are formalized. Um, 
partnerships and, and effectiveness, partnerships and um, processes are so important to our work. But if they're not formalized, if you don't have an agreement, then how can you make sure that you have that data? And having data moving forward is essential. You have to have it all the time, right? You have to be able to go back to the data. If you can't get the same data you had in your initial assessment, when you kind of go back to do a reassessment or to do your evaluation, then you're going to be, it's going to hold back your progress. So you want to ensure that you have those formalized. And what that looks like is if you're getting data from the school, if you're getting data from a public health authority, that that relationship is somehow formalized. I always suggest using a memorandum of understanding. And I think it's important to think about this. And I worked with a community that just came to me and said, I can't do that. We're a small community. This is a handshake relationship. I can't ask them to sign a memorandum of understanding. And that's okay. But a formalized written written policy or a written agreement to share data means that when the the folks that you shook hands with leave, that that still stays in place. When leadership changes or policies change, that that has to be reviewed and looked at by everyone. And so it makes makes it easy. It makes it harder for people to just say, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, so when we worked with this community, they said, we just can't do that. We talked a lot about with them that an, a memorandum of understanding is the is part of a longer conversation. You're not going to come in and say, hi, I'm Erin. I'm working in prevention. I want your data. Can you sign this memorandum of understanding where you say you're going to share that data with us? It's really a very long process of building that relationship, building their capacity, building um, a trusting relationship before you ask for that formalization. And, and almost always people are willing to do that. I mean, it builds those institutional um, connections. Um, so, and I see Emily says she totally agrees about the importance of formalization, even small communities where people are used to operating informally. Um, and and it, it, it was a stumbling block. So Emily, thanks for being so honest and sharing that that was a stumbling block. It can be really difficult, um, especially in those smaller towns when everyone knows each other and you're, now you're asking someone to like, can you sign this or write this down? It, it may not feel as comfortable, but it's so important because we do see a lot of change in leadership. Uh, we see a lot of change in staffing. We wanna make sure that we formalize those agreements. It will protect your work moving forward. So let's think about capacity. So I'm not gonna lie to you, capacity is probably the most important step as it relates to everyday sustainability. There's not... <laughs> You have to build capacity. You have to focus on this step of the SPIF because um, capacity is, it's what's gonna build this the community support. Um, so when we think about these milestones, we think about community readiness um, so that you've assessed and, and have that data on what community readiness looks like. So once you've completed that assessment, that's a key milestone to get to. Staff capacity, so we're looking at community capacity, we're looking at staff capacity, that you've created a plan for building capacity. So that's an important piece is that there's a plan in place. Not just, I know these are the things and we'll get to them, but there's a clear plan in place of how you're gonna do that. Um, and relationship building and key partners and champions are, um, are in progress so that you're continually building key partnerships and building champions in the community. This is one where I say it's in progress. This we never arrive at this. We're always continually doing this work of building relationships with partners. Sometimes that's because there's new partners that are um, over that have turned over, and you need to build relationships with them. And in some cases, it's really because um, you know your priority was to get these three partners on board. They're there now. We're going to continue to build partners to spread. Um, the capacity throughout the community and to build those champion relationships where those folks can help you build more relationships. So these are our milestones that we think about. And the reason we wanna do these things is because they're really gonna help us build the community support that's foundational, but also the organizational capacity. So again, so as I go through these, I want you to put in the chat, um, 
what, you know, if you disagree or if you agree, if you've seen this in your communities, but we know that community readiness assessment um, will help us to understand and build community support. We have to do this assessment so we understand where the community's at. If they're not ready to address the problem, our efforts are less likely to be successful. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're focused on assessing community readiness. We also need to identify those capacity gaps in our staff. So we're not just looking externally, but internally, that's gonna build that community, that organizational capacity. So again, that foundation of sustainable prevention. Capacity building um, plan is created. So this is about effectiveness. This is about, um, I mean, it's really about all the things. I could make that case for all of these, but organizational capacity as well, that we have a plan in place that we're gonna be effective in that plan. Uh, so, and that we can build the capacity of our staff to implement programs with effectiveness and with fidelity. So that's what we think about and putting that plan in place, not just again, having an idea of what the gaps are, but having a solid plan will help to ensure that we get there. Um, and lastly, that relationship building is really about community support. Those are the folks, those partners are gonna help to build capacity in other areas of the community, and those champions are going to help to build um, and share the message and the importance of prevention. The more community support we have, the more likely we are to be able to move this forward. So thoughts or questions, feel free to put them in the chat at any time. I'm going to share a little bit about what this looks like. What does it look like really to um, um, when we think about uh, capacity. So I'll share this story that um, it's, it, capacity building, like I said, is so important. It's kind of hard to underscore it uh, enough, but it's, it, I wanna talk a little bit about staff capacity because it's easy to kind of overlook the importance of staff capacity. So having your staff trained in understanding the SPF, the value of the SPF and prevention science, um, really it, it gets to all the other things. If your staff have the capacity to understand the strategic prevention framework, they're more likely to implement it with fidelity and buy into the process. If they are trained in and understand um, the programs that you're putting into place, again, that gets to effectiveness. But without a plan, what you're going to see is that you don't get to a place of community buy-in. You don't get to a place of, uh, excuse me, not community buy-in, but of staff buy-in. You're really, this is where we see turnover. So I've worked in communities where they have really high levels of turnover and in, inside their staff with the folks who are doing the implementation or with the folks who are managing their coalitions or managing their grants because they don't have that same buy-in. They don't have that same connection to the work. So creating a plan for how when new staff come in. So I worked with an organization that had this large amount of turnover and we talked about what are the things, what's the, the development plan you have for those staff? And is it different for different ones? also for volunteers, anyone who's doing the work. Once the plan's in place, then hopefully what you're seeing is you're building this capacity and keeping folks on board. So thank you for sharing. It's your fourth day. Welcome to prevention. <laughs> and there's a lot of new information. So having a way to talk to your supervisor or talk to other folks in the community to process what you're learning and to build your own capacity will be essential to ensuring that you're invested in the work, that your team's invested. Um, so Building your staff's capacity is going to build that foundation for sustainable prevention. I'm going to move forward, but if you have any other thoughts about what this looks like in your community or why you think this is important, I do see that um, Aaron says um, capacity building is building relationships where we are starting a new relationship from scratch or need to make new multiple relationships, um, also continued nurturing those partnerships. Right, and when we talk about kind of the everyday tasks, it is the regular approach to nurturing these relationships. That's, thank you, Erin, for that. Also, I'm jealous of the spelling of your name. <laughs> um, okay, let's keep going. Uh, planning. 
And again, so as we move through these, you'll see as we get to those tables that the milestones start to change and where they they line up on, on the, the relationship to the keys. Here in planning, we're talking about making sure that your risk and protective factors are prioritized, meaning you're looking at data to understand what's influencing substance use in your community, and you've prioritized the things that have the most impact. Again, that's essential because you're not going to reach outcomes and you're not going to be effective if you don't have data-driven prioritized risk and protective factors. So that's a key milestone. Another milestone you're going to look at is strategize, uh, strategies to address the priorities that you've selected. So you've selected strategies. You've not just selected any strategies. You've selected the ones that line up with your priorities for risk and protective factors. A logic model. I could talk at length about the importance of a logic model, but having that roadmap and putting that on your list of things we are going to accomplish during the planning stage is going to create an environment that's going to move forward to help you build sustainable prevention. Without it, you lack a roadmap. The last milestone is implementation of a plan. Uh, is created meaning that you have a plan for how you're going to do this, an implementation plan. You know how you're going to implement these strategies. You have a clear plan. Um, having these action plans in place makes a map for you. And having a map means you can stay focused, meaning you're going to be effective. You're going to reach outcomes. You're going to have the capacity and the support. So it's really, you know, I can't underscore enough how important when I keep saying a milestone is to have a plan created or developed. It's really, that's a milestone you want to reach um, to ensure that moving forward, everything plays out well. So if we look at, sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. When we look at, um, uh, why is this not, I'm not, there we go. Sorry, my slides weren't forwarding. I apologize. Um, when we look at planning and these, I, I kind of gave a hint away. These are going to fall a lot in effectiveness because, there we go, um, risk and protective factors that are prioritized mean you're going to be more effective in your work. Um, strategies that are directly aligned with that are going to make you more effective in your work. A logic model, I mean, I could argue that a logic model is important for all the reasons you could ever imagine, but it's really important in being effective and building that foundation of effective prevention because it is the roadmap that's gonna drive you and keep you focused. So when things start to get difficult, when the wheels start to fall off the wagon, you can go back to that logic model and it's gonna keep you focused on effective prevention. And lastly, is that an implementation plan is created. The implementation plan is going to help you ensure that you build the right organizational capacity. It is going to make sure that you are effective from the beginning because you have a plan that's driving you there. And it's going to help to build community support because part of implementation is building support for your strategies so that the community supports that work. Um, and that's going to help that adoption piece, right? So again, with the end in mind, thinking our implementation plan, we should build community support so that our strategies, that's one of the things we want to sustain, can be sustained through adoption. Or we can also think about how that brings in resources, having that plan in place and building that community support for your strategies, it's going to get you to all of those, those things. Um, so what does it look like? And again, I invite you to share in the chat. What does this look like? What does it feel like for you guys? Um, I'll share with you again, kind of from the planning perspective, um, The milestone for me that speaks the most is that milestone around having a logic model. And I, there's whole trainings, day-long trainings, week-long trainings about the use of logic models. But it's important in sustainability is what I want to focus on here. I worked with um, actually a state and they had put in place um, a grants throughout their state and asked folks to do this, this work, but hadn't put in the requirements um, that might have helped from the beginning. So there was no logic model requirement. So folks went out there, they did the work. And what we started to see over time was that the communities really started to kind of flounder, if that makes sense. What, they, what started to happen 
was um, they started to lose their focus. And when something was hard, they kind of changed directions or they weren't focused on, um, they were no longer focused on the, the priorities or the risk and protective factors that they had discovered through their assessment process. And they were unable to really kind of stick to one approach because they didn't have that roadmap. And ultimately, we went back to the state and said, hey, let's think about ways that we can help these guys really focus and stay on track. And they said, yeah, we're not really sure why this isn't working. What we ended up seeing is once they trained folks and how to use a logic model, made it part of their requirements, which you know everyone loves, um, they started to see a more direction from those those communities. They started to see the work become more effective because it had this roadmap. So as hard as it is to create a logic model and to get people's buy-in to do that work, it takes time, it's difficult, but ultimately it helps people and it helped these folks really stay focused on outcomes, focused on addressing those strategies and really doing high quality prevention. It was a roadmap. And I can't, I say that a lot, but it really is this roadmap that when things get hard, you're like, nope, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to follow this route that I laid out and I can make adaptations. I can make changes. I can be flexible, but ultimately staying on this route that we've picked. Um, and as I'm telling you that, I've seen um, comments that um, people have said, yep, logic models are things they've heard. Um, uh, a lot about. Someone's asking, do you do a training on developing effective logic models? We have in the past, and you can look those up. You, we can share some resources with you on logic model trainings, but there's a lot out there if you search the PTTC network. Um, someone also shared um, that they've been working on a logic model, and it's really giving you insight on things that you missed initially. Um, I'm so glad to hear that because it's not easy work, and so recognizing and sharing that you got something out of it is helpful. So thank you for sharing that. Okay. Um, I'm going to move forward into our next area of the SPIF, which is implementation. The implementation process uh, is in large part what we feel like is the bulk of the work that we're doing. And I will, will be really clear that I think implementation is um, it, it is where we're gonna see a lot of this work happen, but it's also where it's easy to forget about it. So the, the things we think about in implementation is that you have str strategy, um, strategy specific capacity building plan implemented, meaning when we talked about this a little bit with our last one, right? is that you have to build the capacity of people to understand your specific strategies. So once you're into implementation, you know, it, in your plan, you want to make sure that's built in there. But really, in the implementation phase, you are going to um, you're going to really emphasize that moving forward. Um, you're going to make sure that you build the capacity of your partners who you're going to be working with and others in the community to see why this is valuable. Um, Fidelity monitoring system is in place. So we all know the importance of fidelity monitoring. We all know the importance of making sure that we're collecting process data, making sure that you have a system in place and not just like, yep, we're gonna do that and here's the data, but there's a real system and a process in place for how that's gonna be collected and used. So having that in place is gonna help to build a foundation for you. Process and outcome data collection is a process. Again, similar concept. We're gonna be looking at what is process data and outcome data, how are we collecting it? What does that look like? And then key partnerships are formalized. So again, getting back to this concept of formalizing these relationships, we want to make sure that if we're doing a program and we're partnering with, um, for example, the YMCA, we want to make sure that that is a formalized relationship and that we have some documentation, whether that's a memorandum of understanding or another way that we would do that in our communities. We want to make sure that it's formalized. The program is always a danger of falling apart if we don't have a more formalized relationship. If we're working inside the schools, we wanna have a formal relationship with the schools where it's in writing that they've agreed to do their portion, that we've agreed to do our portion, and this is how we're gonna move forward. You can even start to talk about, we're gonna do this for two years. And then 
In year three, we're gonna train your teachers on how to do this. And in year four, we'll support them as they do it. And in year five, you'll take it over. So that's the, those formalizations with partnerships or uh, with partners can be even that specific, specifically in the implementation phase. Those are our concepts. Um, and thank you, Chris and uh, Rebecca for putting some information in there about uh, some trainings uh, that are recorded or available. Um, so let's look a little bit about what this looks like. And I'm going to tell you, implementation is going to light up this table all across the board. I'm just going to show you that really all the things that we're doing are going to hit all of these. So high quality implementation that's focused on being done um, with formal relationships, that's focused on being done um, with um, processes in place and monitoring. These are going to get you almost all the foundation you need. If you're building capacity for a specific strategy, your organization is going to hold on to that. It's going to make for more effective prevention, and it's going to build the community support. Right? Same that we see for process and outcome collection, that it builds organizational capacity, community support, and effectiveness. This one really, when we think about having this in place, uh, that data collection, we're making sure that we get the information um, and ultimately that information will help us build community support. And the same with these key partnerships. Um, if anyone has any other thoughts on how implementation, um, how these milestones are, other milestones that you work for in, sustain, in implementation, how those support your sustainable prevention, feel free to drop that in the chat at any time. But you'll see, again, implementation is such an essential component, doing it well, doing it thoughtfully, doing it um, in a way that um, builds these three areas of sustainable prevention is going to be really a key focus of your work. So if you're not thinking about sustainability and implementation, you're going to be behind um, on, on creating sustainable prevention as you move in to the final steps of the SPIF. Um, one of the... <laughs> This is always um, a, a story that I like to tell, and I've told multiple times, uh, and this poor community has heard me tell it, but I worked with a community um, years and years ago who did were really a high-functioning coalition. They did all the right things. They picked really great strategies that spoke to their work. They had a logic model, and they put in place all the things that you would need to to move into implementation well. I mean, they really were just um, really... Um, on point in their work, high functioning. And they had uh, they had the intention, every intention to collect process data and fidelity data. And they had a plan in place for how they were going to collect it. Their plan did not extend into what they were going to do with it and how they were going to look at it. And so they started to, in the middle of their implementation process, kind of trip up on some things that weren't working and some feedback from their partners that was less than positive and weren't able to understand why. They, like, listen, we're high functioning and they knew it. We're high functioning. We're doing all the things right. We're really like, we're crushing this. But what they'd done is they collected all of this fidelity data and they had it in a nice little pile on someone's desk, but had no plan for how they were going to review it. And once they reviewed it, what they were going to do with it. And that's so important that we move past just the collection and into the, what are we going to do with it? So they missed a number of opportunities that when they went back to that data and looked at it, like there were some places where that fidelity data that was being collected from implementers showed there was some need for some changes. And they missed some opportunities for mid-course correction, ultimately making their program less effective and losing community support in the process because their partners were, were frustrated that they didn't see what they had expected to see from those programs. So it's great to have a plan to collect it, but make sure you have a plan for how regularly are you reviewing that fidelity data, that process data that's coming in? How regularly are you doing that? What are you doing with it? Who's doing it? How is it getting communicated? And then how are you making um, changes as you go along? It's really essential that there's a plan for that. So we saw this with the support community. And once they figured that out, 
then they were able to make changes and were able to kind of back on track. Um, so I, you know, I think it's important for us to remember that when these we meet these milestones and when we the work we do to get towards them really does help and move our our effectiveness. Um, and that's effective prevention is such a foundation of mean, maintaining sustainable. Okay. Um, evaluation. Um, sometimes evaluation feels really far off and it's easy to, to not think about it in the beginning. And we know that just like sustainability evaluation is important to be considered from the beginning. So when we think about evaluation milestones, these may be happening over the course of your entire process project and not just kind of at the end when we think about the evaluation. So the milestones um, for evaluation for sustainable uh, sustainability that we work towards in the evaluation stage is that there's a plan in place I feel like I'm starting to sound a bit like a broken record. You always are gonna to wanna to have a plan in place for all the work you're doing. Evaluation capacity building is ongoing. So you're making sure that both your evaluation team, whoever that may be, um, and your, it has the information that they need, that they have the skills that they need, that they have um, the training they need, both in evaluation, but also in the work of, of prevention so they understand the importance of, of the evaluation they're doing, but also that the evaluation capacity of your coalition and your partners so that they understand the importance of that evaluation and how to look at that evaluation data. So monitoring of ongoing um, outcome related data. So we wanna make sure that we have an ongoing process for how we're monitoring outcome data. I spoke a little bit about how we're monitoring and, and using uh, implementation data and process data, but this is really about that outcome data. Are you looking at that regularly? Because it is gonna come in somewhat regularly where you'll have a way to look at data that's related to your outcomes. So you have to have a plan in place where that you're regularly doing that. So also we're gonna look at regular updates. Um, you wanna make sure that you are sharing with your partners what you're learning throughout the evaluation process. That's throughout the entire SPIF process, especially during implementation um, and during the evaluation phase, that there is a way that you are regularly communicating those findings with partners, with the coalition, and that also that you're creating reports on those findings. So those are the milestones we wanna be hitting, right? That we're providing updates, we're monitoring the data in an ongoing way, we have the capacity and a plan in place. These all really, I think, tie together nicely. If we look at how this relates to our, our um, three keys to sustainability, you're going to see again that this kind of falls all over, but it's going to, um, it's going to fall all over the chart and I really need to be able to advance my slides. Um, so having a plan in place is going to help with your effectiveness, um, your, that your evaluation is an is effective, but also that your strategies are effective. Um, ongoing capacity, ongoing evaluation capacity is really going to speak to that, obviously, organizational capacity that you're monitoring um, and communicating. So that's, you want to make sure that you're monitoring that data. And I kind of spoke to this earlier so that your community builds you have that community support because you're staying focused on outcomes. You're staying focused on being effective. So it's gonna help you be effective. The more effective you are, uh, the more focused you are in staying close to those outcomes and those priorities, the more community support you build. And then lastly is this regular, um, regular updates and reports. Um, that you're sharing, and that's going to build community support. The more you're communicating, whether it's with your coalition, with your partners, with your funders, uh, or with the community as a whole, sharing that data, not holding it too tight, you know, and making sure that people are hearing about the work that you're doing. Um, if you're going to make changes, they need to know why you're making changes, and the data is going to be what supports the, your, your changes in your programming. So that helps to build and maintain community support and trust. Anybody have any thoughts or questions about those milestones? Again, I kind of feel free to drop them in the chat. I'd love to hear from you um, about your, your thoughts on these milestones in evaluation. Again, sometimes we just haven't gotten to evaluation in our minds. 
these are things that can be happening um, from the beginning of your work. So um, what does it look like in, in action? I'd be interested to hear if you have anything to share in the chat, feel free to drop that in. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about what we know to be true about sharing this data and sharing it in a way that um, where you have control of that narrative. So the regular, um, so working in prevention, I have seen a number of communities where um, they haven't done or they have done well, one of the two, the work of communicating that data and having that data, especially that outcome data, reviewed regularly. I worked with um, a college actually that was collecting data um, throughout the year. They were doing this kind of regular outcome level data collection about use patterns and risk factors. And it was a lot of work and they had a plan in place for how they were gonna collect it and how they were gonna review it. And they did that on a regular basis. They built their capacity to do it. They made sure they had people in place who could do that review of that data. So when out of the blue, they, uh, the state reached out to them and said, we have this money, we want you to apply for this grant, show us that you have a need for it and we'll give you this money. So it was like kind of a, a gimme, right? So if you could do this and you could show that it's a need, we'll, we have the funds, we'll give it to you. Um, so when they were invited to apply for that money, they had on hand data that showed we are making progress towards these outcomes. We have, we uh, there is an issue and we know how to address it. Um, you can give us more funding, we'll be able to do an even better job. But because they had that outcome data on hand, they could show that there was still an issue and they could show that they were doing work that could, could make a dent in that, right? So um, I think it's really important to remain focused on looking at that data so that you can make that case. Um, and ultimately they received that funding and they were able to put a new program into place and continue to make better progress towards those outcomes. So having outcome data regularly reviewed puts you in a better place to make the case for your work and to show your progress when called upon. Um, it doesn't happen all the time, but if you don't have it handy, it's not you're not gonna be able to be successful in that. So again, anything you wanna add in the chat about what evaluation milestones look like for you and your community, feel free to drop that in. Love to hear your thoughts. Excuse me. We have um, created for you a handout that I think has been shared in the chat already that lists all of these milestones and how they relate to the keys to sustainability all in one place for you. So you can can take a look at that, see them all in one place, um, and hopefully you'll find that that useful. I think I can, I think I can show that. Let's see if I can. Can you all see that? Don't give me a yes or a no. Yes, yes. we can. Wonderful. So this is, we've created this for you. Um, to take away. And what you'll see is it has the definitions of the keys to sustainability. And if I scroll down, you'll see what we just went through, um, looking at the milestones and their relationship to the, um, the keys is here for you as well. This is a great tool to share uh, for you as a, as a job aid. It's also a great tool for you to share with your coalitions, your coalition members, your supervisors, your organizations, so they can see the importance of some of the work that they may not wanna really invest their time and energy into, but this is a great way to show them that. And um, you'll also find in this, and we'll get into this next, the next set. Um, so uh, Melinda, thank you for sharing. She said in the past, we've were involved in a statewide program that had everything you talked about, logic, including a logic model. Um, it had a lot of data collected and looked wonderful, but when doing it in a small rural community, the strong partnerships could not justify the amount of time and energy and funds to the small outcome numbers. The local program fell apart. Do you have um, any experience where you have followed all the right moves and it didn't work? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, and thank you for kind of that honest sharing about um, your work. It is, 
you can follow all of these steps and still have things not work out well. Um, and, and part of that is, is if you don't have the community buy-in or you're not showing um, that effectiveness. Um, what I would always encourage communities in this situation to do is to go back to the data, go back and see, are we, has it shifted? Um, can we show that we've made a change in one small area? And then can we, can have a little win and then show um, and, and move forward into the next thing? Or can you kind of reduce your efforts so that people can buy in? So you're not um, asking uh, from them what they're not able to provide, but maybe asking for something um, a little bit more manageable. But it's it's not uncommon for this to kind of be very, very difficult and to feel like it's falling apart. Um, and there's a way for you to adapt to make these things work in your community. So I just wanted to share that. And I, you know, I know that's not a great, you know, specific answer to how to, to, um, to, to salvage what might feel like is falling apart, but I encourage you to kind of keep with it. Think about how to adapt these processes and this work so that it fits into your community. So I'm gonna move into kind of what are these everyday tasks? So we talked about, and can you see that now? Did I go back? Did I do it? You did. Back? Yay! Um, sorry. When technology works for me, I'm very, very proud of myself. Um, so let's get into the everyday tasks. So we talked about all these like, things you're going to accomplish, but every day in your work, you're working towards sustainability and you may not know it. So let's look at some of what those things are. When we think about the everyday tasks of in coalition, um, we think about the work that we do. And so when you think about the work you do, and so to share with me in the chat if these are things you do um, and or these are things you want to start doing or you uh, maybe you want to do it in a more formal way. So some of the tasks for coalition building or coalition maintenance is to make sure you're maintaining a regular coalition meeting schedule. Uh, make sure that you are following coalition best practices because that's a coalition best practice. That you're creating and supporting a sustainability work group. So in your everyday work, Make sure that you're connecting with that sustainability work group. Make sure that you're talking to them, that you're supporting them, uh, that you're helping them do their work. Uh, that's gonna be every day, right? That's all the work we do weekly or monthly. We're making sure that those things are happening. Um, you're checking in with coalition members regularly. It's something that we often forget to do, but those coalition members need the same kind of care and feeding of any executive board. So you're gonna make sure that you're really giving them what they need. You're checking in with them, making sure that they still have buy-in, uh, making sure that they have what they need to, um, to stay on the coalition, to continue to provide insight and support. Um, so those regular check-ins, so make sure they're scheduled, make sure they're on your calendar. Um, maintain uh, records of coalition meetings. So one of the things that's most important um, in prevention, I mean, in all of our work, right, is to document the work that we do. Because um, I worked with a colleague who used to always say, didn't document, didn't do. So if you're not documenting the work that you do and how well it's going or not going, maintaining that process later, making the case for it, it's gonna be difficult. So you're gonna make sure you just keep records of what you're doing. That's part of your daily work. You know, Make sure that the agendas and the minutes are documented. Make sure that uh, what's happening with your membership is, is documented. And then make sure you're um, monitoring and evaluating your coalition uh, participation and representation. So all the time in your coalition meetings, you're going to make sure you're monitoring, are people showing up? Do I have a couple of members who are um, kind of erratic in their participation? Do I have some folks who are uh, dropping off for a reason? whatever that be, that you are monitoring and making sure that you have representation on that coalition from all parts of the community that need to be there. So that's something that you're going to do regularly. Every coalition member meeting, you're going to make sure you're taking attendance and you're keeping an eye on participation. That all ties together with this work. So Dolly says, yeah, we do all these things. I'm so glad. Um, and, and think about and I think it's important to remember, you may be doing this, but remember that it's sustainability work. And I think sometimes we think, oh, I haven't done any sustainability work. But quite honestly, a lot of what you're doing is ensuring that sustainability. These are things that are going to get to that organizational capacity and community support that you need to build. So 
those are some of those everyday tasks. I think there are a lot of them in coalition building that we could probably add. Um, so if you have any, throw them in the chat. I'd love to see that. Um, we also want to think about in evaluation and assessment. So I kind of put these together because they really go hand in hand. Um, so things that we do every day in our work to make sure that we are um, building sustainable prevention in that assessment and evaluation stage, we're going to monitor our data. Uh, we're going to monitor community readiness. So is that changing? So can we do a, um, another community readiness assessment to see if that's growing or changing? Are there ways that we can check in through key informant interviews or discussions with folks to find out if our readiness is improving? You want to make sure that you're just collecting the data, that it's coming in, it's coming in regularly, um, and that um, you're communicating that data with partners. So again, kind of every day, making sure that the data that's coming in, you're sharing that data with your implementers, that you're sharing that data with your supervisors, with your funders, that you have a, a, a way that you're kind of regularly sharing that information. These are the things we do all the time that build sustainable prevention. And Jim shared that they have a huge list of coalition members, but sometimes we have less than 10 people show up outside of staff. Um, and that's something that you really wanna think about is making sure you're monitoring that. What's happening? Are you calling those coalition members? Are you having conversations with them? Do they feel important? It's really important for people to feel like what they do brings value. So if they don't feel like they're, what they bring is important, they're less likely to show up. So taking that list, going to that coalition, um, going to that list of coalition members and really working through it to see who needs to be here and who can I really reach out to and support and uh, bring them back in. Thanks, Chris. She shared our coalition best practices recording. I did a webinar in the fall about um, coalition best practices that might be really useful as you think about that work. Melissa shared that regular communications through systems like constant contact allow uh, to measure the levels of engagement, even if you don't see folks that are still listening. Yeah, absolutely. So regular communication with folks is great. And there's ways that you can kind of make that easier on yourself. Um, so thanks, Melissa, for sharing that and Chris for your sharing as well. So evaluation is really about making sure that data is continuing to come in, that you're looking at it. Um, you're having, you're doing that all the time. Uh, you're doing that all the time anyway. So just know, again, that if you're not doing that, make sure you are make sure you go back to this list and say, yeah, I'm, I need to make sure that I am communicating the data more regularly. Um, and communicating it with your coalition members is going to be important. They're going to start to see that their input is essential. They're also going to start to see the importance of um, the work that they're doing, that it's making an impact. Uh, so those are things that help build that foundation of sustainability. Um, in capacity building, the tasks are really similar um, to what we know to be uh, get to those milestones. These are the things that are going to get us to those milestones, and these are the things that we need to be doing every day, right? So, and it, it ties really closely to that coalition work as well. So, we're going to build and maintain relationships. We're going to develop, um, and that's that convert, you know. And you'll see my my image of coffee. We're having coffee with folks. We're building relationships and we're maintaining them. So, as we build new relationships through you know, conversation and discussion, we're also going to maintain the ones. Put time on your calendar every week to check in with a new partner, to um, have a call or a cup of coffee with an existing partner and make sure that they have what they need and that you're, they again, feel important. Um, you want to develop prevention knowledge in your partner. So that's really the work that you do of helping people understand the importance of prevention the importance of the SPIF process, making sure that they understand these things, sharing with them resources like the resources we've shared with you today. That's the work you do every day. Again, make sure that your coalition meetings have some professional development on it for your coalition members so they continue to grow in their understanding of the work. Make sure you're gathering input from folks. So making sure that in the you're gathering input about is what I'm doing helping is uh, is your level of engagement sustainable? Making sure you're just having those conversations. Again, this is all about like having these conversations with your partners and your coalition members. Um, and identify funders, and build relationships. This is one that's really important. Make sure that you're identifying in your community who are the folks that could adopt this work or 
bring in new resources for this work. So whether that's a local um, service organization, whether that's a youth serving organization as a partner that has funds to share or could pick up the reins. So be thinking about that in your daily work as you, you know, put time again, put time on your calendar to say, I'm going to spend an hour this month looking into funders in my community and finding out ways to connect with them. The more they know about you before you need resources, the more likely they are to support you when you do. Um, bring them in early. In planning our everyday tasks, the things that you're always doing, right? You're already doing this. You're already making sure that the links, um, that links between your priority areas um, and changing priorities, right? So making sure that it, as things shift, that those links remain tight. So if there's a change in use patterns in your community, making sure that your priority areas and your strategies still line up. Um, so just kind of keeping an eye on your logic model, which is another thing. You know, I always tell people that your logic model should be posted next to you. Um, I used to say in our offices, like next to your phone, but like how many of us have like a desk phone anymore? Um, but making sure that it's near you and you can take a look at it near your calendar. So when you look up at your calendar, you see that it's always on your mind and that you're reviewing it to make sure it continually lines up with changes that you see from the data. Um, and then keep keep up to date on evidence-based and evidence-informed practices. I work with um, a colleague and a mentor who talks regularly about honing your craft and putting time on your calendar to grow your understanding of your work. And so this is one of the places where he does that. Um, making sure you know what how the evidence is changing and how strategies may be coming in and that you could put in place in your community. Okay, oops. Implementation is the last one I want to look at. We've talked a lot about this, but we want to train and support staff. So that's that implement that capacity building plan. Just make sure that that's happening on a regular basis. You're maintaining day-to-day -day implementation. You're monitoring it. So making sure that those fidelity sheets are coming in, that you're reviewing them, that um, you're regularly keeping track of what's happening. Um, you want to make sure that you're assessing fidelity. Um, again, through that data collection. Every day, um, every week, you're going to communicate with your implementation partners. You're going to talk about how things are going. You're going to check in with them. So again, put that time on your calendar. Um, you're going to collect uh, that process data. So that data is going to come in using the plan that you've developed. It's going to come in. You're going to process it. You're going to think about it. Um, and you're gonna make sure that uh, you respond to it as needed. Um, and then document all the processes that are in place, making sure that you document the work that you're doing. So again, these are everyday tasks that are gonna get you to those milestones and they're gonna build that sustainable foundation. Ultimately, what we know is that good prevention creates sustainable prevention programs. Doing prevention, following um, our models with Fidelity, following the SPIF process with Fidelity, these are the things that will build organizational capacity that will ensure effectiveness and build community support and create a foundation that's sustainable. Good prevention practice builds sustainable prevention. That's what we're asking you to do. That's what we're looking at every day that you do to build that. So if there are questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I know I feel like I've talked quite a bit. I feel like um, I appreciate all the time you guys have spent. Um, sharing your stories and listening to, to our uh, some of the information we had to share. And feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, but I do want to see, like, was I at all successful in communicating these topics? So we're going to put this post test up and say, how did I do? Um, so we're going to put that up now and ask you the same questions we asked earlier, which are about what are the three keys? Um, when is it important to start sustainability? and an example of a sustainability everyday action. And just a reminder that if you did not take the pretest, please do not complete the post-test. So only those who completed, completed the pretest. Thanks so much for that reminder, Chris. And we're gonna leave that up as we kind of just um, go through. Uh, I wanna just talk to you a little bit about some possible next steps. 
we always want to think about how are we using this information moving forward. Um, the one thing I want to highlight for you in this list is, you know, there are all kinds of things you can do. Um, select a task that you're going to focus on. To have a conversation with your colleagues about this work. The one I want to highlight is the one at the bottom, which is we have a sustainability and planning intensive course coming up, and I encourage you to apply for that. Um, we have an application process, just to make sure you know what you're getting into, and we have a, a committed group. So take a look at that. Make that one of your next steps. Um, Chris, did you? I'm going to. Sure. If you want to go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm <clears throat> so good at. Oh, ah. There we go. Oh, there oh. we go. <laughs> All right. So um, we would love to hear what you are thinking of uh, putting into action as a result of this uh, of this webinar. Um, if you go to this website, which will be put into the chat here in a minute, we'd love for you to say, what are you going to work on? And if you like, you can put your name and email address in there, and we will follow up with you to see how things are going with the task you're putting into action. So we know that if we don't put something into action quickly, um, right after we attend a training, we will likely forget all that we heard. So I encourage you to make a commitment to action. That's great. Thanks, Chris. Please, yeah, take that time. I'm not going to go over these because they are in the handout, but there are a ton of resources out there on sustainability, um, tools and uh, information that hopefully will support you in your new work. I see we have a lot of new folks, um, so or those of you who've been in the field for a long time. So we want to thank you so much for that. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris. All right. So wanted to make sure that you are aware of a few different things going on. And um, while we do this, I know we just had the post test, but I know for those of you who often come to our trainings and webinars, we have we usually have the GIPRA, um, GIPRA evaluation that you get connected to after this. We're doing a little differently today. We have a poll up instead that please go ahead and let us know how well this webinar worked for you. Um, one is not at all satisfied to five is very satisfied or the equivalent for the other. So just to, to point that out to you. And feel free to put any uh, comments in the chat as well of if you want to move beyond the numbers in terms of giving us some feedback. And feel free to just send it to Rebecca or myself if you want to private message us. All right, make sure a couple things that you know about coming up. We have our deep dive into prevention ethics session. Our next one is coming up next week on February 1st. Um, you can join in at any time. This is not something that you have to attend all the sessions. So if you'd like to join in, we'd love to have you. We have on February 15th, drug trends in the Great Lakes region. What are they and how do we address them? We have our NIATEX Change Leader Academy for Prevention Professionals coming up in March. This is a four session uh, series, intensive training series. Aaron and Scott Gatsky are the ones who will be training, uh, leading that. Prevention works in a call to action on March 20th. Kevin Hagerty from the University of Washington Social Development Research Group is going to lead us with that. I'm really looking forward to that. As Aaron mentioned, highly recommend that if you are wanting to take a deeper dive into sustainability and really start putting the information into action that Aaron talked about today, to sign up for our sustainability planning intensive training course. There is a uh, the on our website as you know as it says at the top, you can get to the application for that. Another one which I'm really looking forward to is on April 11th is We Serve Two, Increasing Resiliency in Military Connected Youth. And finally, one other that I'll highlight at least now is Media Literacy 101 for Substance Misuse Prevention Practitioners on June 20th. So be sure to put it on your calendar. Save that time. Wanted to point out a new resource that's up on our website is if you are looking at pursuing prevention certification and are wanting ideas of how to practice and study for the prevention certification test, we have this document with links to several different websites where you can get some tips on how to study and prepare for the exam. So recommend a logging into the, our website and pulling that, uh, downloading that one. 
If you haven't already, I'd love for you to follow and like us on LinkedIn or Facebook and or Facebook, depending on what kind of social media you use, if any. That's where we put up daily information that we found that we think might be of interest to you all. I put a post up um, as we were talking today on sustainability, so you can go in and access that if you're interested. And as uh, we are wrapping this up, I want to go ahead and say a huge thank you to Aaron uh, for leading us on this webinar. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then also a huge thank you to you all for your active participation. Aaron, any last words before we wrap up? I would just say thank you all for being here, for taking the time to make sustainability a priority in your work. And remember, you are doing the work. You can do the work more intentionally and you can create and build sustainable prevention. So I'm really, I'm really happy that you were here to do this with us today. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Rebecca, for being on the back end and helping us with all the tech and making it all go so smoothly. Greatly appreciate you as well. All right, folks, no, I will follow up with an email with some of these links if you, if you missed them in the chat. So uh, watch your email. Great. And Jade, I see a question about where are those test resources? We'll make sure to put that in the email as well. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks.